All right, so joining me on Radio Labyrinth this week is an award-winning voiceover artist, comedic actor, director, producer, and instructor. Now, Shelly, how do I pronounce your last name properly? Shinoy. That's what I thought, but I wanted Shelly to. Shinoy. Yeah. Shelly Shinoy. Yeah. Shinoy. And even if you've never seen her, odds are you have heard her. Shelly, welcome to Radio Labyrinth, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Now, a listener, uh, I think to the radio show that I'm on, uh, is working with you right now, taking your classes and and recommended me. And I looked at your IMDb and all your roles. You have so much work out there, it, like tons and tons of work. You know, he's like, I think Tim would probably like to meet Shelly. And so that's how we got the ball rolling. But let's back up a little bit. You're reading your biography yeah. on, on, uh, on the Internet. Uh, it's you got started. I think you, it says your first television commercial was when you were seven years old. Was that a national commercial or a local commercial? Oh, the first TV commercial I ever did was I was seven. It was a local commercial that shot and ran in Columbus, Ohio. And then the next year, I auditioned for a movie that Jodie Foster was directing, and I got in. Wow. Uh, Little Man Tate. Little, so you're in Little Man Tate? Yeah, I play a child genius. Wow. I didn't see yeah. that. I didn't peruse everything. There was so much. But, it was uh, actually how I met uh, both Jodie Foster and Harry Connick Jr. Wow. And uh, then, like, 15 years later, I met Harry Connick. Uh, behind the scenes, I got invited to a... He had just done a Broadway show and I got invited to the after party and uh, I was back there and I was like, hey, <laughs> remember me? This genius kid from Little Man Tate. He was like, you were in Little Man Tate. He had no <laughs> recollection of me, but of course with the movie, I was like, yeah, I was, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, and he was like, oh, that's so cool. We, It was great. He's he's awesome. What came first, being a performer or wanting to be a performer? If you understand my question, because when I was a little kid, you know, oh, yeah. all I did was annoy people by doing bad impressions of people like Howard Cosell, all the uh, 70s people. My hero was Rich Little um, and Fred Travelina. Those are the two guys I got into the the 70s, you know, peak impressionists. But that whole world, I, I was obsessed with it and i always wanted to do it wanted to do it wanted to do it and that primarily was radio i think i remember being five six seven years old getting a radio a little snoopy and charlie brown transistor and from then on that's right. that's what i've been enamored with and that's what i'm doing but just your whole life performing right and and did, did you know what trajectory you wanted to take when you were younger yeah, uh, so much so that I will never forget. You know how you have those memories of people that like took a grand opportunity to shit all over you when you're like yeah. a kid, all over your dreams. And yeah. like, you're like a grown adult, like living your best life. Like I told you, you know, so-and-so's dad, I knew I was going to make it. By the time I got to high school, theater was my saving grace. It was the I just was in every program, every show. And then right after high school, I was in a national touring company and I went on three national tours performing Broadway. So it was, it was just crazy. And, uh, and I remember my senior year, a lot of the, my senior call friends in the class, their parents love to ask the other students, like, so what are your, what are your plans? And I remember this kid's dad who this kid was like, he's a big film director now. I mean, big enough. And he's lives on the West coast. He's doing some good, handsome projects and like some really good stuff. And his dad was like, what are you going to do, Shelly? What's, you know, what's your trajectory? And I was like, I, I got to get to New York as fast as I can. And my answer was, I've got to get to New York as fast as I can. And he was like, for why? And I was like, to be an actor. I mean, if you want to ride the waves, you've got to be where the waves happen, right? Mm -hmm. And he laughed in my face. We were in Utah. He was like, New York City is going to eat you alive. 
ironically. <laughs> That's some good encouragement right there. In oh York. yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you're. This you're... is me <laughs> eating eating New York a lot. I mean, New York was so good to me. And I've always been good to New York. New York has always been good to me. I think the best people in the world are here. I think the hardest working people in the world are, are here. And, uh, and, and, you know, a couple of years after I got here, stuff really started to take off. Did you do improv oh. and, and comedy theater? Oh yeah. Yeah. I had a comedy group with my brother and my sister and one of my brother's buddies, and we ran this camp in Columbus, Ohio. I mean, the camp is north of Columbus. It's called Camp Akita. You can look it up. It's an amazing camp. And years ago, like late 90s, um, we had an improv troupe called Three Smiths and a Barger. <laughs> and it was just four of us. And we had hundreds of kids coming to these improv shows where we're just taking you know, words from the kids and then basically just making fun of the kids and their experiences at camp and just really self-deprecating stuff. And kids, would we realized like we had something going here when kids would leave and make that 90 minute drive back to Columbus or wherever they lived and wherever they came from. And then the following week at the end of the next campers end of week show, they would drive back to Camp Akita to come and see three Smiths and a barger to see the show wow. soon. We had, you know, a couple thousand people showing up to this improv show. And we were like, um, like, I think we have something here. And that was in the late nineties. That was right after high school for me. Wow. So, um, yeah. And then I moved to New York and, uh, started an all female sketch comedy troupe called the brothel. <laughs> and, uh, we, we re re wreaked havoc, uh, as it were proverbially. Now, is uh, the, we did really well. It was great. In that situation, you work on a show all week long and then you have a, a, a couple of weekend shows at a theater. You know, no, we would work on a show for a couple of months. Oh, OK. Put up a three night run of that show. And then uh, and then the next season, we would work on a show for three months and then put up a three night run of that show. Must That's what we did for the first year. Wow. Then we got invited to open for Gloria Steinem at the Women's March in 04. Wow. Uh, in front of a million people. <laughs> like it was like 900,000 people were at the Women's March or something like that. It was it was ludicrous and we opened for they wanted the brothel to open for Gloria Steinem and we did, you know, two or three of our best, you know, home run sketches. And then after that, uh, we, we, you know, like we entered in a couple of festivals. We won the funniest week of Chicago in 07 or 08 um, and had a couple sold out shows there. And eventually, I think it was like in 05 or 06, when we were right in the thick of it, um, we were offered a location on the lower east side of manhattan where we had the downstairs of a bar so we had our own theater wow. they had and we built a stage in the back and we had sold out shows and that was when we started doing weekly shows and they were i'll never do that again <laughs> it's a lot of work i imagine it was a lot of work it was a lot of writing and it was the best uh work I ever I mean like because you're constantly writing I mean you're a kid and you're hungry and you're like this will be funny and and then you're writing it out and then that weekend you're performing for a sold out show and like we would have guest comics come and like Eric Andre opened for us one one Saturday night like I mean he slayed I mean it was amazing no doubt. what sorry I said, no doubt. He's hilarious. He's unbelievable. But like, you know, and then uh, just Seth Herzog, who opens every night for Jimmy Fallon now on his show. And and like, you know, it's a very tight knit community. I mean, we all were doing comedy where that no one came to. I mean, like all the locals and all of our friends were coming to these and selling these shows out. But like it was us nitty gritty Lower East Side doing comedy for years. So you make it to New York and I know I'm probably skipping around, but what was your first, what's your first voiceover gig? What's the first thing that you're like, damn, I got this and this is what I want to do. 
uh, a bunch of us New York City like underground comics, we were all asked to do a roast. And um, what we were doing was this was before roasts were are what they are now. They were roasting the original cast of of MTV VJs. Oh wow! So uh, in the so the brothel was hired, and we were just there to like, okay, uh, Missy, you do this, Maggie, you do this, Shelly, you're doing this, and I was asked to roast Courtney Love, and so I thought all right. Uh, you know, and I was like, I'm like 22 years old and I'm brand new to New York. And I remember thinking like, Oh God, I, I was raised in like a, in like a religious cult, right? Like there was no MTV. I don't know anything about MTV. And so I'm Googling like old clips. Cause I don't know. I didn't know very much about Courtney love except for what I had maybe seen in the news. And so I'm looking at her and I'm thinking as a, like now an adult New York city comedian, or at least a a child adult (laughs) being like 23, 22 or whatever. I was like watching these clips of her. And I thought there's only one way to roast this woman. It's to show up to the roast as this woman. Oh man. So I was like, all right, uh, I can, I can get the look down. I can do the hair. I can, I can I can do the behavior and the and her the whole spiel and I've just got to get her voice down and I've got it. And so no problem. So I watched a handful of clips and I was like, I've got this. And I showed up to the roast for my part of the roast and I just behaved as Courtney Love for uh six minutes. Wow. And okay, they didn't tell me that Courtney Love was going to be there um she was there in the audience and she was laughing louder and harder than anyone in the room and I was like okay I think Mm -hmm. I think I'm all right um and after the show was over someone uh, another comedian that was hired um approached me and he was like so you're a voiceover artist and I will never forget what I said to him I said I, I wish I heard that they can pay their rent <laughs> uh, because like we were all like broke comics, you know, right. and, uh, and he was like, no, no, no. Uh, and he introduced himself and he was a huge voiceover celebrity. He had been working with Lucas films. He'd done all their video games. He was, I knew, I was like, oh, cause I knew his name, but I didn't know what he looked like. Mm-hmm. And then he is introducing himself. He's like, no, that's me. And so he says, uh, don't worry. Um, I I know a I know a star when I see one. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh then a couple of weeks later, like uh, I don't know, the next month, he called me and he was like, Hey, can you do um he was like, Can you be the voice of a princess? And I was like, a princess, uh Oh, oh, look at those little birds. Oh, why, of course I could. So I was like, all right, I, I think I got a prince, some sort of princess in me. Sure, yeah, okay. And so I show up to this audition and it's for a doll that's being sold in Great Britain and uh, Africa and Great Britain, I think. And um, and the there was a DVD, this is how long ago, a DVD that was being sold, a DVD cartoon of her life story. And, um, and so I auditioned to play the princess and then, um, I remember looking through the window and they were looking at me like, you know, and I was like, oh, move your hand. Let me see if I can try to see what you're saying. Cause I couldn't hear anything. I'd never been in a voiceover room before. A bo- very quiet. Room. Very yeah. Quiet. I was just like, what are they, what do they think about me? And, uh, and he came back and he was like, okay. Um, the producer and he was like, can, you know, we heard a lot of really good things about you. Can we just throw a script at you and see what you bring to the table? And I was like, sure. Cause I'm from improv and sketch. I was like, yes. And bring me any yeah. script. I'll, I'll throw whatever I got at you. And they were like, great. And so it was like, boom, 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 boom. They were just throwing these scripts down and I was, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Done. And I just committed to everything that I did because that's just who I am as an actor. I just went for it. Like no fear. I I'm, I'm going for this all the way. So they called me, um, a few days later, I think it was the following week. They called me and they said, Hey, uh, you did not book princess Zara. 
but you did book her sister, her brother, her handmaiden, her mother, her grandmother, and two of her kidnappers. Wow. And I was like, okay, um, what? And they were like, we're paying you per character. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and, and so I showed up. This was when I learned that all of the characters were African. Now, this was a long time ago. And now, of course, with things being the way they are, I would be like, you need to hire some African actors. And it's just a different time now. But then I was like, what is this magical world? And they, there was an African dialect coach there who she could have read the parts. And she said, no, I this is... I train actors to speak like how I speak. You do this. And I was like, okay. Definitely was a different time. <laughs> oh my, uh, yeah, it was It was totally different. It was an introduction to a world where there was no judgment. There was throw your hat at the wall. Let's see what happens. We went for it. The, you know, it was, we created something amazing. It was, it was true love. And then three months later, the producer called me and he was like, hey, have you ever voiced for a boy? My answer was like, I've seen the Simpsons. I know how this works. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say yes. <laughs> I'm seeing, you know, I know what Nancy's up to. Yes, for Bart. And I showed up and I thought it was going to be a bunch of other girls. And it was a waiting room of 25 eight-year-old boys and me. And wow. I was like, oh my God. And so they had me audition for Hooked on Phonics for a DVD uh, called uh, Aaron Knows Everything. And it's a little boy that just points at everything and says what it is. <laughs> and um, then while I was in there, they had me read for a couple different things. And they called me a few days later and they said, you didn't book Aaron, but we want to pay you full price to come in and coach and voice direct the 11 year old girl that booked the role. She happened to have the better voice for the part. I had no boy strategy at that time. I, I now have voiced several boy characters, but then I was just like, you know, throwing my hand on the ring, but they said, aside from you, you know, uh, from her having the more perfect voice for the role, we want you to coach her so that she does every single thing you did in your otherwise perfect audition can we pay you full price to come in and direct her and i was like done a hundred percent i knew i was going to be able to work with this kid i was like a million percent yes and then they're like oh and also we want to book you as the narrator on all nine dvds and you're also doing a couple different sound effects and a couple different animated parts and i was like there it is okay <laughs> that so is fantastic it just snowballed. So my second job ever was my very first voice directing job. And that was 2003. No turning back after that, right? No, no. I Cartoons, was video done. games. Done. Yep. Commercials. Um, it's just really impressive. I encourage everybody to look Shelly Shinoy, S-H-E-N-O-Y. Of course, this is video, so you'll be able to see your name. You'll have a little character graphic underneath you there oh, but God. um yeah i'm not doing that dustin will do that he's our producer and co-host yes Appreciate but dustin. uh I, I do want to talk about the instructions because i want to sign up so you know just i have a question all right i'm gonna say it anyway yeah. i've always wanted to do it i've always wanted to do it ever since i was a little kid but it takes work and as we were talking earlier you no one's just going to magically hand you something. You have to be uh, working on things and and uh, and actually trying. And anytime I get to that point, well, let me see. I got to make a demo. Yeah, I'll do that later. <laughs> I'm just being honest. You know, this is this is my yeah. life. Um, and I have done a couple of TV things, but they're because I knew somebody. So I've been on. Uh, there's a show called Squid Billies. I've been on there three or four times doing Larry Munson, who was the voice of the Georgia Bulldogs. And he talked, nice. he used to talk like this when he was alive. And then one, the very last one I did, it was my own actual voice. And other than that, though, but then I, I think, now, how am I going to get an agent? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Now, I'm just going to do this and this and this. And my question, to boil it all down to, is there a, a way that somebody who could be a late bloomer who says, I'm 51 now, I'm going to start working. Is there an opportunity to get into the business at that age? Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Okay, good. Right before the pandemic, I uh, coached this guy who was like 88. Oh, fantastic. He flew to New York from Colorado 
to record his demo in New York with me. And this was back when things were in person. This is before we knew what COVID was going to be. Mm-hmm. Thank God I he got out of New York, you know, before we got slammed like three weeks later. Uh, and he was fine. And he went back to his place in New York and he's been working and doing stuff ever since. I mean, he he's a retired federal judge Wow. and he, and a working attorney. He loves working. He's a workhorse. He loves it. He wore a bow tie to come and meet me. I love him. And we worked here and he was, he's a, he's a really hard worker and we made it happen for him. Well, awesome. Well, so, okay. When, when I booked the consultant, uh, the first consultant, uh, what do you call it? Class? It's not a class. So, it- no. So I have one, this one session, it's an award-winning session. It's, and, and I created this because of how many people were coming to me with, um, all different, but very similar, uh, life scenarios. And, uh, what it was, was, okay. So I took all of these things and I created something called the career counseling session. And it's literally for, I've had celebrities take the career counseling session. And I've had people that have never worked in the industry ever, like as an actor, as a voice artist, anything like a stay at home soccer dad, who's like, oh, you know, I think I want to try to, and I give them a career counseling session and I give you a good amount of fairly enjoyable prep work mm-hmm. so that you come to the session fully dialed in to exactly what it is that you want to know for real because the prep work prepares you for knowing like oh my god and i never really thought about this oh i should ask a question about this and like i ask you pages of questions and in answering them you give me all the information i could possibly want to know about you and then uh and then i have you prepare these questions that you're going to bring to the table so that everything is specifically answered for anything you could want to know about any area of the industry and i train people based on every tragic mistake I've ever made <laughs> like every random thing that's ever happened to me the roller coaster being shot out of a cannon into international stardom to you know being a struggling actor that had no idea where to go or what to do or where to start to sitting in the sound studio with um advertising execs and sound studio producers understanding what they want to hear in a voiceover demo and why it's so important to have certain elements on a demo that like are going to raise you above the hodgepodge bullshit that's everybody else's generic tragic commercial demo which you can't even really call it a commercial demo and just having this crazy you know inside in-depth knowledge of what makes a good demo and how to get it from people Mm -hmm. and so crafting these demos you know for for people and then also training people how to audition like you can be the best voice actor in the world if you don't know how to audition for what you're auditioning for no one gives a crap how good you are because you flummoxed your audition, you're out. Mm -hmm. And somebody far less talented, frankly, who knows how to audition is probably going to book the job over you. And that's the case with a lot of things. If you know how to do a good interview, you can get a job over somebody more qualified than you and might even be better than you. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. The career counseling session is really the starting point for anybody. And then after the career counseling session, I do intensive audition training. And as a result of the audition training, you know where to go, you know where to audition, you've got a strategy, you've got a game plan to follow, and uh, you know where to do it, how to do it, you even know what to expect. And you've got not only a banging commercial demo, but also I produce, fully produce six radio commercials for you. Oh, nice. Because I'll never forget what it was like to hear my first radio commercial played on the air, like hearing my first radio commercial ever done on air. You never forget it. And then when you get it back, like if you're able to get it back, like I know how to train actors, how to get their work back Mm -hmm. because it's a never ending roller coaster. You will never You'll never hear yourself if you're listening for yourself, first of all, on the radio, and you'll never get your your finished commercial back if you don't know how to ask for it and when to ask for it. 
Awesome. Well, I look forward to that. So soon I will be signing up for that. And then I'm going to commit sure. because it'll be a lot of fun. And then sure. uh, I will, if you don't mind, I will update people with my progress. I I would love it. I would love it. It's not easy. No, I know. I want to challenge. I want to challenge as if uh, what I'm doing now is challenging every day because we improvise 99% of the radio show. It's, it's mostly humor based, some issues, okay. things like that. I do... Okay characters and and um one of the other co-hosts she's fantastic at what she does too and and uh but i really want to hone it and you know i don't want to bore people who are watching this with what i want to do because i'm talking to you but that's that's where i'd like to go so I, i'm looking forward to it and you know we'll talk yeah. again about that yeah well and keep in mind too and this might bring you comfort mm -hmm. if you sign up for one of the audition intensive training programs um one of the questions that's going to be asked to you uh before you even start is how intense do you want your intensive to be okay i will i will stick with that i will stick with your work ethic what your tolerance level for the work is and how much you're willing to put into the program i that's what i'll take from it but like so it, it really does have to come from you but so long as you understand and so for people that say uh so the person that reached out to you john he asked for a, a 10. A 10. And he gave me a 10 out of 10 effort. And that makes him one of my favorite people ever. I was training someone at the same time who also asked for a 10. Mm -hmm. Didn't go so well. <laughs> no. Okay. So, um, so, you know, but like, it really comes down to like, you understand you're starting a new in a new side of the business, like you're, you're starting a new business and no, of course it's not too late. There's a perfect, a huge demographic that you can target and you can even reach above it and below it for your vocal demographic targeting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for what you're going for, you've got a huge market in front of you. It's just a matter of how hard are you willing to work to, to then get the, get the career. I'll tell you what, I have a couple more questions, but what the thing that's really triggering me right now is I like listening to audiobooks. I love listening to audiobooks, especially if the person reading them can tell the story and do the characters. And I've been reading, listening to this real long series. It's like 14 books. And at the ninth book, it changes. And the person who read the first nine is a fantastic narrator and, and character reader. Uh, if you're familiar with that genre, his name was George Guidall. I think he's passed away or he's really too old or whatever to work. Um, but the, the, the person changed and the new person doing the story is doing all these characters I'm familiar with, but he's bland and boring and I can't follow the story. And so I'm like, you know, I could do this. I just have to learn how and, and be confident in doing it. So everything's fortuitous. And I, I appreciate John reaching out and connecting me with you. Mm. Um, I just blathered on there. I hope you don't mind. No, uh, the uh, do you listen to audiobooks or am I just being nuts? Uh, I have an an audiobook. Um, have you narrated any too? Uh, soapbook soapbox. If yeah. you would, if you would like for me to get on it, I will probably destroy your dreams. Oh, oh uh, are you going to tell me that you? Okay, it doesn't pay much, and it's a lot of work. You you already know. So okay. this is journey is over. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, we'll move on from that. Well, no. So it comes down to, yes, you can do audiobooks. Yes. If you understand um, unbiased uh, psychological, like uh, unbiased narratives, if you understand mm -hmm. uh, that the terminology to, um, to have an unbiased narrative while doing clean character splits, you can be an incredible narrator. Um, however, I uh, anybody that comes to me and is like, I want to be a great narrator, I'll say, how many years have you been um, producing auditions and your own voiceover work? If it's zero, cool. You have two to three years before you even attempt your first book. Mm -hmm. Two to three years of being a full-time commercial artist with sprinkles of animation in there, absolutely. But on, until then, absolutely not because you're you're in a, you're like, you're you're dead. You're dead you you're dead however once you become an incredible editor and you can you can split that stuff together asap you can be incredible and you will have a great time mm 
mm-hmm. but I don't let anybody touch it unless they've been in the industry hammering away their precision editors. They are lightning fast. Then you can take on an audiobook and it will be worth the money. Okay. Until then, it will not. And it's, I don't want you to go bankrupt. So <laughs> I, won't, I won't let you go down that road. All right. Now, before we wrap up, and I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours because this is really cool. But I want to ask you, I just discovered because of the emails we've had going back and forth, we are the, are we the internet TV. And I've never seen any of those videos before. And I spent a half hour watching the ones that you were in laughing my ass off. And I have to know, it, it, go out and find it, by the way, if you're watching or listening to the podcast, We the Internet TV. Some really, it, it took me by surprise because of the, the content and uh, it's kind of subversive for this modern era. So yeah. who, wh- what happened to it wh- and where did it come from? Okay, so it is brilliant comedy that they call middle of the road comedy. Okay. Where they are firing at both sides of the political and pop culture world. Okay. And what happened was, I think we, the internet, like they shot up. I think when I joined the sketch team, they had 87,000 followers on YouTube. And by the time we wrapped, I wrapped my fourth year with them. They had like 179,000 followers on YouTube. The very first sketch I ever did with them went viral. It was over. I was on the team after that. It was their first sketch that ever went viral. Mm -hmm. So like we were like, we, it was just, I was meant to be in their pod. They are incredible. They are the funniest writers. What ended up happening? So if you if you have listeners that are that are here and going, hey, hold on, comedy isn't dead. Like people should be, you know, like you know, people should be equally made fun of, <laughs> yeah. with love and really high intelligence. Um, then um, then go to we the internet and say, hey, where are your sketches? Because they dissolved the sketch team. And what we ended up doing was uh, Lou Perez, who was one of the, he's like the head guy that was hired to to run all the sketches. Um, he started putting together his own sketch stuff. Oh. And so he, he was hired by a media company uh, to called fire to, to put together a sketch just uh, two months ago. And after a kind of a dry COVID, you know, we weren't doing a lot of on camera stuff. Um, we did a sketch. I don't know if you saw this one, cause I don't know if it was actually in my signature, but it was a sketch of two Midwestern moms in a garage of a really shady looking drug deal with a <laughs> Russian and a New York mobster. Did you see this one? No, I have not. I'm right. Yeah, it wasn't in my signature. Okay. So, um, so that one, you know, we put on Facebook and it had over a hundred thousand views in the first like four days. And what it was, was it's not two Midwestern American moms doing a drug deal. It's two Midwestern American moms doing a drug deal for baby formula. I just, I see it right now. Baby formula drug deal. I'm going to watch it. Oh my gosh. And so it did really, really well on Facebook. It, it was shared, you know, a million times. It was so, so funny. But uh, so, yeah, so we, the internet, man, they need to bring back their sketch team because, you know, we're like, we've all been killing it on camera, but like together it's just an unstoppable force with Lou Perez and myself and Gary Mahmood and Greg Burke, one of the greatest directors ever. And, you know, and so just, just an amazing team. And uh, we're kind of waiting, we're chomping at the bit to, to go back and do some stuff, but there are hundreds of thousands, a couple million hits on some of these uh, sketches that we did. English as a second language video was hilarious. Cause you just think it's okay. It's this. And then boom, it's everything. And that's the one, the first one I watched and I thought, holy shit, I need to that watch was, more on this channel. That was the first sketch I did with them. That was their first sketch that went viral was the well, it was ESL. Hilarious. It was, it was yeah, great. So that, that sketch for your viewers is um, an ESL teacher that is teaching ESL students, English as a second language students, new gender neutral pronouns. <laughs> there are in fact 64 new gender neutral pronouns and i was teaching them the gender neutral pronouns in the videos 
hysterical. It is. And in addition to laughing in my brain, that little connection. Oh, you're not supposed to 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 talk about or you're not supposed to make fun of this. And you know, people no. like you said at the beginning, you know, you people want you to punch up, not punch down. I believe you punch sideways and you get everybody that way. If you actually are paying attention to that sketch, we never make fun of anyone. No one. Not one person. We don't make fun of it. We don't belittle it. In fact, if anything, I I like hone in on one student in particular, and that's Lou Perez. He's the head comedic yeah. writer. I think he wrote that sketch. Um, I I honed in on him. Um, like you don't want to be a bigot. Yeah. Right? Like like you have to learn this. Don't you understand? And so we never make fun of anyone. If anything, I, I go after a guy because he's asking questions. And I'm like, right. don't ask questions. Just learn the language. But it's taking the the topics that are around everybody, the things that are going on and putting them in. It's just like anything. Else. It's the setting. Tangible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Putting them in tangible, very yeah. real scenarios. And they're hysterical. Shelly, thank you so much for coming on with me. Where can people find you online and where can people find more about the classes? Sure. So online, on I'm Shelly Shanoi everywhere. So on Instagram and on Facebook and my website, ShellyShanoi.com for um, coaching and directing and, and having helping people start careers. That's nycvocoach.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, I train people all around the world every single day. Every one of my programs is remote after COVID. Um, I just learned to get with the online and, uh, and I was, and I had started actually teaching remotely, um, in 2017 mm. was the first time I was like, maybe I can take a student in London. Yeah. And, then, and it just, it was seamless. It was just getting them to have their, if anything, the program became harder because I made sure that they mastered at home recordings, which is where I do all of my gigs right here on this microphone that you can't see. I'm the voice of Zales. I'm the voice of McDonald's. I'm the voice of Quilted Northern. I'm the voice of, you know, HBO Max, HBO Max right now. And like just all of these things I do right here. Nice. And if you don't know how to record yourself, audition and edit yourself and, you know, record yourself from home in, in a very affordable, you have to have the right equipment and you have to know how to use it. Like I said, if you want a castle, you've got to build the foundation. So I'm here to help people build their foundation so that they can build their castles. And, and that's yeah. NYCVO coach. And I will work on my blueprint and I will talk to you soon and uh, we'll get going. Awesome. Thank it was so me. great to be here. Thank you so yeah. much. It was so fun to get to know you. Yeah, you too. Thanks for joining uh, my show, our show. I call it our show because there's three other hosts, but just me today. So thanks, Shelly. I will look forward to meeting them on the next one. Yes, you will. Because we'll have you back on. Yeah, man. I can't wait. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. <laughs>